Okay, great. So uh, as Peter said, and as you can see on the slide, um, the question of my talk is, is it morally wrong for a man to claim to be a woman? Now, in the abstract that I sent on in advance, for anyone who read it, um, I promised two parts to the talk. You can see this on the handout. Um, the first was presenting arguments that it is wrong, and the second was presenting arguments that men have the right to do it, so it can't be wrong. But when I presented this in Melbourne as a practice talk, I got the very strong feedback that I had two completely separate talks stuck together, um, and then I should focus on what I had been considering the first part, which is obviously the more surprising and controversial part of the talk anyway. So that's what I'm going to do, um, although I will end by talking about uh, just one of the arguments from what I had been considering as part two. And I'm focusing in this talk specifically on the feminist case against men claiming to be women, um, rather than trying to make a more general case. So the feminist case uh, involves making arguments that are specifically about women's interests. Um, while a more general case might refer to, for example, gay men's interests or children's interests uh, or general societal interests, for example, what liberalism requires. Okay. <clears throat> So before we get into the arguments, um, I think it's important to try to resolve some ambiguity in my question. Um, obviously, for anyone remotely familiar with this debate, I will be aware that there is some disagreement over what the terms man and woman refer to. So <clears throat> gender critical people think that a man is an adult human male and a woman is an adult human female. So they'll hear my question as, is it morally wrong for a male to claim to be a female? In case it needs saying, they also think male and female are biological categories. Now, while some people believe in change of sex and some trans women do claim to be female, there will be an unduly narrow interpretation of the question that would limit our discussion to what's morally wrong with claiming to be a sex that you are not, and so it would sidestep the bulk of what trans women and the trans activist movement and its supporters are actually claiming. <coughs> Trans activists, on the other hand, think that the words woman and female both refer to gender identity. And the same goes for man and male. So they'll hear my question as, is it morally wrong for someone with a man gender identity to claim to have a woman gender identity? And that question will seem incoherent. Someone with a man gender identity precisely doesn't claim to have a woman gender identity. It's hard to even state the issue. So we need to be both not unduly narrow and able to actually state the issue. So as you see, there are at least three things that might matter for the question. Sex, gender, and gender identity. <clears throat> the argument over whether trans women are women is confused by people using the word woman for any of these three things. So a male might claim to be female, that's a sex claim. To be a person subject to the norms of femininity and virtue of femaleness, that's a claim about gender as the second wave has understood it, uh, and or they might claim to identify as female or a woman, and that's a claim about gender identity. Although trans activists think gender is gender identity, so they would say it's a claim about gender. So I'm trying to resolve that ambiguity, at least in part, with these three more specific versions of my question. Is it morally wrong for a male to claim to be female? Is it morally wrong for a male to claim to have been subjected to the norms of femininity and virtue of femaleness? Sorry, it's so irritating. Um, and the third, is it morally wrong for a male to claim a woman identity? Now, I think most, although not all, of the men who claim to be female are simply using female and woman synonymously as gender terms on their preferred conception of gender rather than making a claim to being biologically female. Although there are some who seem to confuse biological sex and legal sex, so they'll say things like, I am female because that's what's on my driver's license. And there are some others that seem to believe in a change of sex. So for example, through having so-called sex reassignment surgery or taking so-called cross-sex hormones. Similarly, most of the men who claim to be women don't quite claim to have been subjected to norms of femininity in virtue of femaleness. It's more that they have a different conception of gender in mind and take the word woman to refer to that conception than that they share a conception of gender with the second waivers and claim that it applies to them. 
So some might wish that it applied to them, or as Captain Jenkins has argued, may take the norms to apply to them, and yet not strictly claim to have been subjected to those norms. So part of what it is to articulate how they have been wronged requires that they haven't been subject to those norms, because people treat them according to the norms corresponding to their sex, rather than to their identity. <coughs> so I think <coughs> probably we should be most interested in the third disambiguation, um, but be open to versions of the first that mean something other than biological sex by the word female, and versions uh, of the second that use women to refer to some external objective conception of gender that may yet be generous enough to include at least some trans women. <coughs> So my goal for the paper is to try and answer yes, it is wrong on any of these three disambiguations. Okay, the final thing I'll say, um, just because it, some people will consider this offensive or controversial, and I'm happy to talk about it in the discussion, but because it's important for me to try to mark that my interest is in the claims to femaleness or womanhood made by biological males, and I want to keep that absolutely clear, rather than obscuring it with language that suggests that the biological male is, in fact, female or a woman. I'm going to be using male pronouns for males throughout the talk. Okay, now, on to the feminist arguments for why it is wrong, uh, morally wrong, for a um, male to A, claim to be female, B, claim to have been subjected to the knowledge of femininity of retrofeminists, and C, claim to have a woman identity. That's going to get super cumbersome, so I'm just going to revert to claim to be a woman in the rest of the talk, but we have the dis disambiguations in mind. <clears throat> okay, I want to talk about four arguments, um, and I'm going to spend the most time on the first. So these four arguments are that it is morally wrong for a man to claim to be a woman because, one, it is inconsistent with a feminist understanding of what a woman is. Two, it involves conceptual and linguistic appropriation. Three, it offers an individual solution to a social problem and in doing so neutralizes critics and rebels. And four, it expresses disrespect to women and women's experiences under patriarchy. So let's go through these in order. So when a man states publicly that he is a woman, this statement, in conjunction with other aspects of his presentation, comportment, behavior, and so on, express or suggest an understanding of what a woman is, or what woman means. Now this is not a point about what's in his head. He might have no particular theory of womanness, no particular beliefs about what he and all other women have in common, or if they don't have anything in common, what nonetheless makes it the case that they are all women. So if this understanding of what a woman is, that his statement and associated self-expression express or suggest are anti-feminist or otherwise incompatible with feminist politics, then at least insofar as we support feminism, which I do, we're justified in rejecting his claim. So we will be saying, effectively, <coughs> no, you are not a woman, because that is not what women mean. Now, we're going to need some desiderata, and of course we can argue about these too, but um, I'm going to take the desiderata for a feminist understanding of what a woman is to be that it identifies a non-gerrymandered or ad hoc constituency, and that it makes it comprehensible why this group needs focused political advocacy. And I'm going to leave open whether it needs that advocacy for largely historical reasons or for contemporary reasons. Now, just compare this with something like the idea of being a children's rights advocate. Children picks out a clear constituency of everyone below the age of legal adulthood. Arguments at the margins about who is and isn't a child don't affect the obvious point that there are children. Once we know that it's children whose rights we're interested in, we can start thinking about the specific vulnerabilities of children and which rights shortfalls they might relate to. And it can be that only a small number of children have their rights compromised, and yet it still makes sense to work for children's rights. So I'm saying so too for women's rights and women's liberation. 
and fem what feminism is. <clears throat> okay, here are a number of understandings of women that a man's statement that he is a woman combined together with his self-expression could suggest. A, a woman is a person with a female mind, whether that mind is encased in a male or a female body. A woman is a person with female typical hormone levels. A woman is a person with a vagina or neo vagina. Or a woman is a person with breasts. Or a woman is a person with female typical secondary sex characteristics. Those are all versions of the same type of thought. D, a woman is any person who is sufficiently feminine. E, a woman is anyone marked out as a thing to fuck. F, a woman is the helpmate of a man. And G, a woman is anyone who says they are a woman. Now, most of these claims have, uh, or at least have had historically, some expression in trans politics. The exception uh, is F. But A is a version of trapped in the wrong body, which uh, is a common, was a common claim made on behalf of trans people, although the movement has largely moved away from that claim now. B is a claim made by the International Olympic Committee and some other sporting bodies dealing with males who want to compete in the elite women's sporting category. The first part of C is expressed by the historical idea that to become a woman required so-called sex reassignment surgery. And again, trans activists have mostly moved away from this claim now, but it was common for many decades. <clears throat> the second and third parts of C are expressed by the idea that is still common today that to become a woman requires taking so-called cross-sex hormones, which will create secondary sex characteristics. D is one way of understanding the claim that being a feminine boy is a marker of transness. And E relates to trans woman Andrea Long Chu's notorious claim that city porn made him trans, as well as something trans women, trans women inclusive, as opposed to exclusive, Trans women inclusive radical feminist Catherine McKinnon has said recently about why she thinks trans women are women. And then finally, G uh, is the explicit and predominant claim of the contemporary trans rights movement. So our question is, should feminists accept any of these claims, A through G? <coughs> no. <laughs> Let me just get forward. Okay, starting with A and B. A and B both trade on the idea that there are two distinct types of persons, uh, where the types will involve things like categorical, psychological, and behavioral differences, differences in things like preferences, attitudes, choices, behaviors, emotions, and so on. But they offer a different naturalized basis for these two types. So in one case, we have average, um, oh, sorry, in one case, we have sex brains. Um, and uh, in the other case, we have so-called sex hormones. And both of these ideas are empirically false. There are average differences of this type between males and females, but there are not two distinct and non-overlapping types of person. And more importantly, these differences might be entirely contingent. At issue between opponents is the explanation of the differences that we see and whether they reveal sex natures or only sex socialization and enculturation. So as second wave feminist, uh, second wave radical feminist Dennis Raymond put it, a female mind in a male body only makes sense in a society that accepts the reality of both. Or a second wave liberal feminist Gloria Steinem wrote, transsexuals are paying an extreme tribute to the power of sex roles. Anything to win from this biased society where minor differences of hormones and genitals are supposed to dictate total lives and personalities, the right to be who they individually are as human beings. The so feminists are trying to move away from the idea that there are two distinct types of persons, again, where this type's idea tracks psychological and behavioral differences, not mere biological differences. So it is not in their interest to accept A or B. The extent to which C is objectionable depends on whether it is a minimalist claim about biological difference or something more. So misogynistic men may see women as largely interchangeable things that have these parts. Vagina, breasts, satisfactory waist to hip ratio. Feminists work for the understanding that women are full human beings, not just sexualized body parts. So it's not in the feminist's interest to accept an understanding of what a woman is, 
that depends on sexualized body parts. It may be in feminist interest to accept an understanding of what a woman is that relies on body parts in the strictly biological sense. But if it's biological differences that, that are being tracked, it would matter why we are tracking them. And this might have implications for how we should consider endogenous versus exogenous body parts, that is, natural body parts versus body parts constructed through surgical and medical intervention. Okay, what about D? So setting aside this question of where to set the threshold for sufficient femininity, here we again have the idea that there are two distinct types of persons, feminine and masculine, where the feminine people are the women, uh, the masculine people the men. So if we divide the world up by reproductive biology, then we have two categories, male and female. If we divide the world up by gender expression, or something like it, then we have two different categories, feminine and masculine which people of either sex can belong to. If all the sufficiently feminine people are women, then at least all the trans women who are sufficiently feminine will come out as women on this view. So again, we can ask whether this is an understanding of women that feminists should be happy to accept. What is a feminist understanding of the relation between femininity and being a woman? <coughs> feminist since Simone de Beauvoir, um, 1949 have worked to reveal femininity as socialized and to decouple femininity from femaleness. Second wave radical feminist Mary Daly argued that the idea of a trans woman as naturally feminine men um, reinforces the idea of a natural femininity which distracts from the fact that femininity is a male construction imposed on female people. So she wrote, male propagation of the idea that men to a feminine, particularly by feminine, through feminine behavior by males, distracts attention from the fact that femininity is a man-made construct having essentially nothing to do with femaleness. And second wave feminist Germaine Greer said memorably that femininity is the fake version of femaleness. Female is real and it's sex. Femininity is unreal and it's gender. It's the role you play. So of these two understandings of what a woman is, one being a female person no matter what she is like, um, and the other being a feminine person no matter what sex they are, the former is more feminist. The former tells every female person that there's no way that she should be just because she is female. She can wear any clothes and have any hairstyle and do any job and have any sort of character and she is still a woman. The mother tells a man that if he is feminine, he must be a woman, and tells a woman that if she is masculine, she must not be a woman. But what is the point of that? Is there some pressing reason to recategorize the world into masculine and feminine persons regardless of sex? Now, one reason might be that it's good for trans people who want to be recognized as the opposite sex slash gender. But if it's good for trans people and bad for women, then feminists have no reason to accept it. Indeed, given that there are so many more women than trans people, arguably no one has a reason to accept it. And I'm just um, just including a picture of some women who are not who are not feminists. This is a man spreading campaign. Okay, moving on to E. Um, so, in discussing the medical approach to males with androgen insensitivity disorder, Greer wrote. Many, but not all, have vaginas surgically constructed for them so that they can function as normal, i.e. heterosexual females. This implies a curious attitude to females as simply bodies with clefts in for the accommodation of a penis. Some prominent trans women have been explicit about their desire for sexual subordination. I mentioned Long Chu already. And also I would note this understanding of women as a thing to fuck has some currency in the popular culture. Um, so, for example, in the most recent season of And Just Like That, which is the reboot slash sequel to Sex and the City, a gay male character objects to being penetrated by his new lover on the ground that he is not a woman. So this approximates thinking about women as a very specific social role, dividing people into the one who fucks, that's the man, and then the one who is fucked, that's the woman. But then sexual roles in men's prisons, for example, 
can be taken to demarcate men and women. Trans women sex workers may then more readily be designated as women. Okay, I'm going to respond to E and F together, so let me quickly say something about F, um, which is that it has a similar latitude in accommodating at least some trans women. So, second wave radical feminist Marilyn Fry describes women as a category of oppressed people, paired up with men to provide them personal service, sexual service, and ego slash emotional service. Think of your average 1950s housewife. Now, if we say that woman is the helpmate of man, then woman is again a social role, and some males can occupy that social role. It would be like saying the woman is the stay-at-home parent, and so calling all stay-at-home dads women. That might, there might well be some men in this helpmate of a man role, not limited to trans women. So on this view too, some men can turn out to be women. And just as a side note here, um, because there are many ways to describe women as a social role, there are many potential substitutes for my E and F. So I've just included what I think are two interesting versions, and both versions that got a lot of uptake from among feminists in the second wave. Okay, so our question is, should feminists support the understanding of what a woman is in E or F? And there's a tension here. Because when feminists describe negative stereotypes or constraining social roles, they do so in order to decouple those stereotypes and roles from women and to resist them. Feminists do not believe that a woman really is a thing to fuck. They believe that some people believe that a woman is a thing to fuck, and they want to dispel that belief and introduce an understanding of women as full human persons. So too for the idea that woman is the helpmate of man. What they're effectively saying is females are not women, at least not in the way you understand women. So I think what we should say about E and F comes down to whether we are happy to be woman abolitionists. I'm not. So I think woman is the name of she who has been stereotyped, socialized, and so on, and not the name of the successfully stereotyped socialized, and so on, creature. I think when we talk about women's liberation, we imagine liberated women, not no women at all. But thinking about gender as a type of social class following the Marxist tradition has led some people to think of women in the same way they might think about a category like slave. So of course we are slave abolitionists. So if woman is just the name of all the bad stuff that has been done to females, or all the bad things females have been made into, then of course we should be woman abolitionists. And calling, some, calling someone a woman would just be to make a descriptive claim about who is a member of that class. On some ways of describing the class, there might be some males in it. Then the man's claim to be a woman couldn't be morally wrong, because it might well be descriptively true. But only if we reject woman abolitionism and retain woman as the word for she who has been stereotyped, socialized, etc., can we reject ENF as feminist understandings of what a woman is. I think we should reject woman abolitionism, and so we should reject ENF, but I concede that there is a reasonable disagreement. One thing I can add, though, before we move on, is that if this is what's being expressed by men when they claim to be women, it had better be true that they're members of the class, and they had better be lamenting their membership. And there is reason to doubt both of these things. So suppose woman means the helpmate of man, then any trans woman claiming to be a woman had better be the helpmate of a man, or a person expected to be socialized into being, and so on, the helpmate of a man. So for any versions of ENF that we can come up with, they're highly unlikely to be true of all, or I think even most, trans women. And more importantly, when trans women say they're women, this is not usually delivered as a lamentation. So compare, for example, someone who is not a Jew, but is often assumed to be one, declaring that they are a Jew on the grounds that they are routinely subject to anti-Semitism. They would not be celebrating this fact. They would be lamenting anti-Semitism and seeking an end to both their and Jews' social mistreatment. 
Trans identifications, in contrast, are usually celebrated as a finding of one's authentic self, and they're generally affirmed. So this is not remotely the tone of, alas, I too am a slave. Okay. Oops, that. Finally, G, self-identification as a woman. So this view is attractive because it's inclusive. It counts almost everyone as a woman who wants to be counted as a woman, and it doesn't count anyone as a woman who doesn't want to be counted as a woman. And it produces the verdict that trans women are women. But it comes at a high price, um, mainly creating a gerrymandered uh, social category made up of people who have nothing in common beyond what they're willing to say, and not even what they mean by what they're willing to say. It thus violates one of the desiderata that we started with for a feminist understanding of what a woman is. Feminists have an interest in a constituency that has something in common in order for there to be a political project worth pursuing. And this doesn't mean that every woman must have experienced the same treatment, but it does mean we would need to be able to pick out whose treatment we are interested in and offer articulations of that treatment. And one clear and consistent way to do that is to take the constituency of feminism to be female people. Feminists can talk about how this group has been treated throughout history and why, and fight for better treatment through political activities. Again, compare the earlier description of a children's rights advocate. So the question is, what could be the justification for a politics for the group of anyone who identifies as a woman? One of the most serious impacts of the self-identification view of sexless gender is that it is eroding the important distinction between sex and gender identity in multiple countries. So a man who identifies as a woman is not female, but in some countries that distinction is impossible or at least very difficult to draw. So in Victoria, which is my state of Australia, any man with a woman gender identity is taken to be legally entitled to the protections of the opposite sex. And whether this is good, bad, or neutral for women is, of course, contested, most vigorously in the UK at the moment, but it does raise questions about conflicts of interest for a range of previously sex-separated spaces, services, and provisions. Serious questions arise for prisons, support, support groups like domestic violence, trauma, and addiction recovery groups, preferential hiring, and lesbian dating, for example. So if it's not in women's interest to have men and women-only spaces or accessing women-only services and provisions, then it's not in women's interest to accept men's claims to be women. So in sum, for argument one, either there is some understanding of what a woman is expressed by some men's claims to be women that is not incompatible with feminist politics and I just happen to have overlooked, or adult human female is the only understanding of what a woman is compatible with feminist politics. Okay, now the remaining three arguments, this will go much faster. Um, in the second case, I want to say something about the concept of gender in the sex-gender distinction, uh, which is argument two. So the sex-gender distinction was one of the most important conceptual innovations of the second wave of feminism. It actually shows up much earlier in feminist history, but it just isn't called that. Don't worry, set it aside. Um, uh, so the sex-gender distinction allowed feminists to separate woman as she really was, or could be, or could have been, from woman as she, as she has been made to be under patriarchy. So theorizing gender meant theorizing the social construction of femininity and the ways in which it shaped women in men's interests. Rejecting gender meant rejecting and trying to dismantle that social construction. Hence, some second waivers calling themselves gender abolitionists or gender eliminationists. So when trans activists come along and insist that gender is instead an identity, they turn a crucial political concept that has been used to advance women's liberation into something very different. Those who love to talk about hermeneutical injustice and what could be a more central case, I would ask, than defanging the central concept of a group liberation politics? With this conceptual and linguistic appropriation, trans activists undercut abolitionism by remaking the thing that has oppressed women into a thing that is indispensable to the self-conception of another minority. And this is really confusing for progressives. 
So should they be against gender because it's bad for women, or should they be for gender because it's important to trans people? It forces people to choose, and because considerable progress has been made on feminism, and trans people are a smaller and more novel group, trans people are likely to be given uptake. So I would say the remaking of gender into an identity is against women's interests, and so something feminists have reason to reject, which makes it all the more surprising that they have instead generally accepted and embraced it. Oh, sorry. I forgot I had notes. Okay, argument number three. So, Janice Raymond's argument in The Transsexual Empire, um, perhaps the most vilified book of the second wave, uh, is that trans politics has turned an, uh, a social problem into an individual one. The social problem was gender, stratifying people on the basis of sex into narrow behavioral categories. The individual solution was to designate those most unable to live with that stratification as transgender offering medical and surgical interventions to enable a small number of people to switch categories. Steinem writes in Raymond, oh, I've lost one slide. Okay, sorry. Um, I'll read it out. Um, so Steinem writes in Raymond that she mourns the loss of individuals who might have acted as critics and rebels in this sexually stereotyped society. Instead of accepting the idea of a female mind and a male body, they might have challenged the very idea that there is such a thing as a female or male mind. They might have demonstrated that sex is only one of the many elements that make up each unique individual. So this is a point about the loss of trans people as critics and rebels against gender. But the same point can also be made about women. Gender non-performing women, who might have acted as first movers in loosening the constraints of femininity for all women are reinterpreted by trans activism as trans. Feminism loses its critics and rebels. And because it is in women's interests for there to be a strong feminist movement, and because a strong feminist movement needs to keep its eye on the social problem, it is not in feminist interest to claim, to accept the claim that a gender non-conforming or otherwise atypical, gender atypical woman is not a woman, or that a gender non-conforming or otherwise gender atypical man is not a man. The feminist must insist that there's no right way to be a woman, not accept that some ways of being a woman, like masculine presentation or same-sex attraction, make you a man. Okay, and then the fourth argument, uh, men claiming to be women expresses disrespect to women. So, again, in feminist analysis, male slash female and man slash women are antagonistic categories. Um, so qua sex slash gender, setting other relations of um, uh, domination aside, qua sex gender, he is the oppressor and she is the oppressed. Okay, some people don't like these words. I've done a lot of Twitter polling on what the preferred word is. Uh, these are all your options and it really doesn't matter. So if you hate the idea of calling women oppressed, that's fine. Just any access, privilege, disadvantage, dominance for a majority minority, minority in the technical sense of not, not numerical. Take whatever you like to express this point. The thought is, if you, in my language, when a man claims to be a woman, he is the oppressor claiming to be the oppressed. Substitute your preferred term. So anything he can identify with or desire that she has and he lacks is either straightforwardly impossible for him to have, like the capacity for pregnancy, or it confuses who she has been constructed to be under patriarchy with who she really is. So for example, suppose he desires to be pretty and decorative, or should be gazed at by men as a beauty object. He's envious that women can have these experiences and men cannot. If he desires to be a woman for that reason, then he confuses her patriarchal construction as a beauty object with her real nature as a full human person. And this is demeaning and offensive to her. And more generally, it's offensive for those who have the social power to avoid a specific type of negative treatment or the risk of it, to nonetheless choose it and then claim to be equally affected by it. She did not have the luxury to opt in or out of that treatment. And just to compare, and I'll again go extremely briefly through this, but here are some comments from the Netflix documentary, The Rachel Divide, which was about Rachel Dolezal, 
and the fifth estate program investigating Buffy St. Marie, St. Marie being a white American who identified throughout a long um, and accomplished music career as Canadian First Nations. And I can't see why the same sentiment doesn't apply to men claiming to be women. Um, so things like it's not a hairstyle, it's not an affinity for music, she didn't go through the struggle we went through, along with the kind of discrimination that are faced um, by African-American women and not by, by Rachel. And then from the Buffy St. Marie um, documentary, taking opportunities from a real indigenous person, sometimes benefiting from it immensely. <coughs> um, positions and awards that would never have been gotten otherwise. Uh, speaking for indigenous people, um, theft of our stories, taking up a lot of space. Uh, that's on there. Taking up a lot of space um, where actual native people should be, articulating an attitude where people think it's okay to take everything from us, now our very souls through identity. Okay. So, my question was is it morally wrong for a man to claim to be a woman? I've argued that whatever he expresses about women in making his claim, feminists have reason to reject. His claim in making a revision to the concept of gender and the meaning of terms thought to be gender terms, like women, is linguistic appropriation. He contributes to the dissemination of an ideology that neutralizes the political by making it a matter of the individual. And finally, he expresses disrespect to women. When did we stop? So when should I stop? Five minutes. Okay, by twenty past. Okay, I'm going to do the last part so we don't run out of time and come back to that part if we have time. Is that right? Okay. So I said at the start that the part two I promised in my abstract was going to become a separate paper, but I wanted to just say something brief about one of the ideas. So the only one that's not struck through is the one we're going to talk about. Um, so that's this defense of the idea of agential identity in uh, Robin Dembroff and Catherine St. Croix's 2019 Ogo paper. So the basic idea is um, that there's a relation between three things. Our private identities, our agential identities, and our public identities, which they also call social positions. Um, so the first and the last of these are just what they sound like, namely how we think of ourselves and how others think of us. So I could be a closet lesbian who is publicly considered to be straight, so my private identity would be lesbian, and my public identity would be straight. And agential identities, in their view, are the bridge that help us to make our private identities into public identities through exercises of our agency. So if that exercise works, then all three of my types of identity become the same. And if it doesn't, then my private identity, my agential identity are the same, but my public identity remains what it was. Now they think that agential identity is important because it's a crucial part of self-determination. And as such, they assert that others have a prima facie obligation to allow and respect an individual's determination of the social positions they occupy. They go on. Um, is that on the slide? Surely, yes. They go on, the exercise of agency that is central to agential identities is morally significant in its own right, and unless defeated by other considerations, ought not to be prevented. So of course the question for the gender critical feminist is, is a man's exercise of agency aimed at aligning his private identity as a woman with the public identity slash social position of woman defeated by other considerations? And Denmark and St. Paul think Answering this question in general depends on whether the private identity in question should be given uptake. And they give two examples where it might reasonably be rejected, one of which is Rachel Dolezal's claim to be black, which we just talked about, and the other of which is Dutch man Emil Rattelband's claim to identify as 49 and want this recognized in law. So he was actually 69, but he was healthy and he was facing dating and hiring discrimination. Now, Denver and St. Paul acknowledge that recognizing and accommodating agential identities can have significant implications. They worry that accepting dollars of identity as black would require revision of racial categories. 
shifting away from a current understanding on which race is at least partly a matter of ancestry toward a version on which race is a matter of desire and personal sentiment. They worry that accepting Russell Brown's identity as 20 years younger would require a rethinking of many of the legal and practical rights and obligations that track records of age, including age limits surrounding drinking, marriage, voting, and retirement, and so on. It is baffling to me that they can say these things about race and age, and yet proceed as if they don't apply equally to sex. Why is it not okay to make race a matter of desire and personal sentiment, but okay to do this to sex? Why should we worry about the legal and practical implications of self-identification of age, and not worry about them for self-identification of sex? Surely letting men into women's prisons or hiring men under preferential hiring schemes for women is just as serious in terms of legal and practical impacts. Okay, of course I can't conclude on this basis for the whole of the part two argument that there are no adequate defenses of the man's right to claim to be a woman. I can only say that this one is pretty unconvincing and then postpone the rest of the argument for another time. And I will stop there. Thank <laughs> you.